right? Did, did I pronounce it correct? Hasbinian. Or how do you say it when you're saying it with an English accent? Hasbinian. Hasbinian. Okay, Hasbinians. Thank you so much for talking with me today. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I've been immersed in your book for for a while now, and I've really been enjoying it. It's it's been such a, I mean, actually, right now we're recording this in January, so the U.S. is in a state of crazy things happening, and so reading that book has actually been right now has been a little bit comforting because uh, I realized this is not the first time that this has happened. It's <laughs> it's been going on for a long time, and we're just in one of those periods of upheaval right now. So I don't know if you you have similar experiences going through this in the United States. Yeah, I mean, it's yeah, as a historian, it's uh, obviously very interesting to live through these difficult times that we're in. As a historian of U.S.-Iran relations, it's uh, it's hard to know exactly how to connect, you know, kind of the whatever you want to call it, democratic crisis or whatever that we're facing in the U.S. Uh, you know, to the, to the history of relations with Iran, but. You know, we do right. have an, 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 as we're recording now, we do have an inauguration coming up next week. And of course, that's always a time when uh, Iran tends to come back into the headlines a little bit. Uh, sort of questions arise about how the new administration is going to handle relations. Right. And that's been really interesting to read, too. I guess you you've been updating the book so much. How did you choose when to stop it or when did you stop uh, writing? Yeah, that was one of the challenges uh, of writing a uh, long durée history that starts in the 18th century and ends in the present day because the present day keeps shifting. It's a, it's a never ending target. Uh, so I did the bulk of the research for this book in 2008, 9, 10, around there. Uh, did the bulk of the writing in around 2010, 11, 12. I was finished by 2013, but the original version of this book was twice the length that it is now, believe it or not. I so believe it, it. Yeah, it took uh, actually several years uh, of editing uh, to just kind of get it down to a manageable uh, length. So, in, and reader, astute readers will notice that because actually the last chapter is very heavy on the first Obama administration and actually relatively light on the JCPOA itself and the Trump administration. Right. Well, so Chai and Conversation is a language learning podcast. And so I wanted to um, come kind of at that angle and ask you about your journey because it was very fascinating to me. So uh, you explained in the beginning of the book, you moved from Iran when you were one year old, one years old, and you started writing this book in 2008. And what's unique about this book is that you have been gained, you have had access to primary source materials in Iran and in the United States. And that's very unique in the people that have written about Iran. And so I'm so curious about your language journey, how you came to the point where you could even study these source materials in Iran. And so can you take us back to, uh, so where were you born and where did you move to when you were one year old? Sure, yes, I was born in Iran, in Tehran. Uh, we, my family, I was, I was born in 1974. My family moved to, uh, to London in 1975 when I was uh, just a little over a year old, 14 months old. And um, we, I grew up, I mean, I would actually say that Farsi was probably my first language. Uh, I remember speaking it slightly. I remember being just a little bit uncomfortable with English when I first started school and confusing some words and so on. But very quickly, very quickly, probably by the age of four or five, English became really my first language, more comfortable. Um, we spoke uh, we spoke Persian at home, like so many people. Uh, you know, I grew up with sort of kitchen table Persian, um, you know, uh, which I sort of embarrassed about, you know, and sort of feel always a little bit awkward when I'm speaking to real native speakers because I like I don't sound very literate or very eloquent, uh, struggle for words, you know, sometimes don't understand what's being said, um, particularly when more kind of Arabic words are being used and those kinds of things. Um, but uh, yeah, I, you know, when I was, we moved to Los Angeles just before I started high school and actually on, my grandmother used to visit one of the, on one of, one of her many visits, she once brought a, um, Farsi Biyar Muzim, uh, you may know that book. It's uh, at the time anyway, it was just a standard, um, you know, primary school textbook. Right. And I love language and I love languages and I love learning languages. And it's one of the few things in life I've always been pretty good at. So mm. uh, like I have a bit of an aptitude for language. So I, and I just enjoy it. So I um, just, I remember sitting down with that book and just uh, in, I don't, I don't remember how long, you know, a couple of weeks or whatever, and just kind of teaching myself how to read and write. Ah, okay. um, in a very rudimentary way uh, and then sort of forgot about it. Uh, that was probably the first peak 
um, and then in high school and and undergrad, I think I became I was never really that interested in connecting with my Iranian roots. To be honest, I did I did British history as an undergraduate and even uh, initially in graduate school and so on. So, you know, forgot a lot of what I'd learned. Um, but was always kind of interested in going to Iran, seeing Iran, you know, and got more and more interested after September 11. Um, I, like a lot of Middle Eastern people, I think, or people of Middle Eastern heritage. And no. sorry, you said you were interested in languages. Did you know other languages too? Yeah, I'd studied in school in England. We'd studied uh, French and Latin. And, okay. Uh, and in, in America, Spanish. Uh, it's, I taught myself some German also when I was um, okay. a kid. I don't remember exactly when. I did, you know, and then later on, I learned a bit of Portuguese, Italian, Catalan, uh, a couple of other languages. I've been studying Arabic recently, which is actually, I was going to come to that because that's really helped my version. It's amazing. Right. I mean, for people who are in a similar situation, there's an instinct. I don't know if I'm going off topic here, but there's an instinct no, um, that I think we have of like, and I was like this for a long time. Oh, I'd love to learn Arabic, but I feel like I need to perfect my Persian first. Right. No, like, don't do that. Because first of all, you're never going to perfect any language, you know, including your own, your own native language. Um, but actually learning related languages can really help you think about uh, the language that you're trying. I mean, Arabic has helped my Persian enormously. That's exactly, uh, you're the second person who I've interviewed who said that Yara Elmdui, I just interviewed, he said the exact, he, it was the first time that I'd heard someone articulate that. So I'm very interested in this idea now. Absolutely. I mean, basic things like read, like actually reading and writing, reading obviously much, much quicker now. Writing, my handwriting is so much better. It's a weird thing, but uh -huh. like, you know, and then you learn all these, uh, you, you know, you understand the language better. You learn the cognates, the loan words, and those broken Arabic plurals that never made sense before. You know how in, you know, people it's sort of in more, uh, at a sort of higher register of Persian, people tend to use these like, these, these broken Arabic plurals, um, you know, like saying madares instead of madreseha, you know, and right. uh, those things would always confuse me, you know, um, but once you learn the Arabic, you know, uh, it's like, oh, okay, you know, uh, and just little right. things like that. So. Um, long story short, yeah, I mean, I started to get more interested in, in um, when I went to, to answer your original question, when I went, <laughs> when I decided I wanted to do this book, um, you know, uh, that was definitely one of the challenges. And, um, you know, it's amazing with language how quickly immersion helps. So like just being in Iran within a couple of weeks, it's like, oh, this is really different. I'm reading street signs much more quickly. I'm just reading everything much more quickly. I'm learning so much vocabulary you know, just by being in that kind of immersion environment. Right. Uh, so, yeah. so then how did, did you get to the point where you could read the source materials quickly? I wouldn't say quickly. Uh, <laughs> okay, yeah. There are, I'll be honest, there are some source material that I still really struggle with. I mean, especially a lot of Qajar era, era documents, oh, right. 19th century documents that are uh, written in a, you know, in a sort of antique way of speaking, a sort of antiquated way of, of writing. Um, often are also not very high quality documents in terms of just, um, uh, you know, particularly, you know, just uh, looking at a lot of old newspapers that are brittle and kind of crumbling and, you know, where, you know, th letters are missing or uh, the type, the type print isn't very good or it's been, right. you know, kind of uh, washed out over the years or smudged or what have you. And, you know, uh, so there's a lot that's hard or handwritten right. documents are, of course, the biggest challenge of you know, letters, correspondence. Right, right. Was there a lot of that in your research? Uh, I think there probably would have been more if my Persian had been better, you know, I mean, you know, to be honest. Um, so I think there's probably a, I don't want to overstate this, but probably a little bit of an over-reliance on printed material, uh, 20th right. century printed material, rather than 19th century, uh, you know, handwritten letters. Uh, for right. Example. That's, you know, that's fine. I mean, the book is primarily situated in the 20th century anyway, so. Right, right. So then what you said you studied uh, British history, and then you wrote a whole book about Africa and traveled through Africa. So what brought you back to Iran? What made you interested in that part of history? Yeah, so I did a degree in history, I did a PhD in history, uh, you know, was I realized as soon as I started graduate school that I wasn't really interested in becoming a professional historian in the traditional sense, uh, an academic historian, I guess. Um, I have tremendous respect for what the work that academic historians do, but it's not for me. Um, I think some of it is just incredibly enlightening and, 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 and impressive. Uh, but I just early on felt like I didn't want to be writing articles that are read by a small number of people right. in, in journal and academic journals and you know, so on. To me, that wasn't the heart and soul of history and it wasn't why I was excited by history. 
So I went into journalism right after my, or even during graduate school. And I was, uh, I did my PhD, um, my doctorate at, uh, at Oxford. And I would go down to London, work for some of the newspapers there and worked in the London Bureau of Newsweek back when that news magazine still existed, <laughs> uh, doing Western Europe stories. And, you know, I love journalism, loved it, um, but I have in some ways the opposite problem, which is that you're writing for a very large audience, but the work can sometimes be a little, a little more superficial. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and so I've been really trying, I've tried ever since to carve out a career of the in-between. I'm very passionate about the idea of academics speaking to general audiences, of making expertise accessible, of especially as historians writing history as a story, as something mm -hmm. that has a, a character, has, a, has some life in it, you know, that Definitely. I believe, you know, I, look, I went to Iran three times to do archival research for this book, and I, I believe that there is enough in there that is highly valuable, I hope valuable, to scholars and experts, but I was still, it was very important to me that this be a book that you could give to your uncle who loves to read history, you know, that you could, you know, that it could still be a good story, that, that it would have a certain pace to it. I'll be totally right. honest with you. I, I think in the, in the process of writing it way too long and then editing it down, when I, when I read it today, one of my frustrations is the first, I think the first hundred pages or so has lost some of that pacing because I did so much cutting and that, that frustrates me, but I would, uh, exhort readers to stick with it because I think that the narrative pacing picks back up uh, after around page 100 or so, so or even page I, I, I thought the first 100 pages were so fascinating though I, I didn't know a lot of it and it's just so frustrating to read it it seems like just the relationship is the series of missteps and it's kind of like a Shakespearean tragedy of like if they'd only understood what was happening on this side I mean I guess that's the whole point of the book if they'd only kind of understood each other better things would be so different. And I hope that people read this book and, and really take that to heart. But so you first moved to um, London and before the revolution, it sounds like, yeah. and then you all moved to the United States. And I've always had this problem as uh, I moved to the United States when I was four, or I was moved here when I was four. And I always had a very uh, hard time with that knowing things that had happened in Iran were because of the United States. How do you reconcile that? Do you have a like doing research for this book, do you have a difficult time being an Iranian in the United States? How do you like reconcile those things? Yeah, I mean, look, I've had in many ways a fairly relatively privileged upbringing. I, you know, I, my parents always put a lot of emphasis on education and made sure that, that you know, did, made actually tremendous sacrifices to make sure I went to kind of really good schools and so on. So I don't, you know, I don't feel, I don't want to tell a sob story. It's not that, you know, I don't, you know, I, I I'm not some sort of you know traumatic experience um, as many people have you know fleeing as refugees or what have you um, uh, you know we were sort of migrants um, you know um, you know having said that yes it wasn't it's not always easy to grow up Iranian in Iranian in the United States uh, you know I frankly denied my heritage for a long time would would tell mm -hmm. people you know people, people, when I was in high school if they asked me what I was I would it was actually kind of weird. I would just Italian. Yeah, well, it was actually very it was worse than that because, I, to be honest, especially in the early years, I remember I was so stupid because it was, I had a strong, a much stronger English accent at the time, and so I would just say, "Well, I'm British, you know, and I'm English, you know." And, you know, surprisingly, a lot of people would buy that, but you know, it's um, you know, and I, and I was and am in a way, you know, but of course, it's you know, um, that's not really the question that's being asked. Uh, but, uh, you know, people would sort of say, no, okay, but I mean, no, come on, you know, like, no, 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 that's it, you know, yeah, you know, uh, my name's John, I'm, you know, Christian, I grew up, I'm from England, you know. <laughs> I mean, it's ridiculous, that, but of course, you know, 13 year olds will 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 believe a lot that you tell them. So, you know, right. I got away with that for a while. Um, and yeah, looking back, that's 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 a shame, you know, um, quite honestly. But uh, yeah, as, as time went on, you know, obviously by, by, by the time I was an undergraduate and, you know, so on, I was much more vocal about claiming that. Okay. And then what is your relationship? Do you still visit Iran or have you, you said you've been three times. What's your relationship with uh, the Iranian community where you are now? And what's your relationship with going back and forth to Iran in general? Uh, so Iran, the last time, so I went three times for the research for the book in 2007, eight and nine. So the oh, last wow. Time, okay. The last time I was there was actually in 09 during the uh, disputed election, actually, presidential wow. election. Wow. Um, and in fact, I left just a couple of days after that and I was trying to do, I'm going to write an essay about this at some point. Okay. There, wasn't, there, was, there wasn't space in the book, I had to cut this, but I mean, when I, I did a lot of the archival research in the midst of that and was 
you're flying out of the airport with a, with a, a bunch of foreign ministry documents on a, on a memory stick. Uh, you know, oh, so wow. you back, you're sort of like, oh my God, that could have gone really, really different. Wow. Um, but, and I mean, there's nothing, nothing dubious about what I was doing. I mean, I, these are documents right. that I obtained with permission, you know, working in the archives, but I mean, it was such a chaotic situation. Right. That, you know, that, that could have easily been misunderstood at the airport, you know, it's, it's, I guess is what I'm saying. Uh, but that was the last time I was in Iran and I would love to go back. And, and you know, I regret not having gone back um, when things were a little bit better around the JCPOA. Right. I think I thought like a lot of people that, oh, it'll get better and better. Uh, there were other things going on in my life at the time. And uh, and then things have got worse and it just doesn't feel like a great time right now. Right. And also I've just been incredibly busy. Um, but my relationship to the Iranian community where I am, look, um, uh, it's interesting because in LA, I had no Iranian friends, which I think is bizarre, probably. Uh -huh. even, if, even if you're not Iranian, uh, how could you not have Iranian friends? But I <laughs> You have to try. You have to try not to have any Iranian friends. No. Um, and look, my parents were very assimilationist. Uh, oh, okay. My mother, especially. I think there was just a, a feeling of like, they just wanted me to fit in and, you know, and, you know uh, all the rest of it. And, and like I said, I think I had a pretty conflicted more than conflicted probably a pretty negative relationship with my own identity at that point in my life as a teenager you know mm -hmm. um so but these days it's, it's interesting because i'm now executive director of the middle east center at penn which means that i have no choice but to uh interact quite a lot with not just the iranian community in philadelphia but many middle eastern communities in philadelphia and, and i phrase it that way but of course it's a it's a very pleasurable choice uh and i've loved i've really enjoyed getting to know not just the iranian community in Philadelphia, which is, you know, not huge, but, but it's there. Um, but also the Arab community, you know, Turkish community, many other, you know, uh, sort of, you know, um, Middle Eastern communities. Uh, so yeah, that's been kind of interesting. Okay. And so what are your tips for people who like you have grown up, uh, not in Iran? Um, so a lot of the people that come to try and conversation, you know, they grew up, their parents didn't, uh, really forced them to keep speaking Farsi or speaking Persian. Um, and so they've kind of lost it. So what is your tip for them? Do you think that it's important for them to go back and, and learn Persian? Uh, yeah, is that an important thing? No, I think that's a very personal choice. I would never be prescriptive about that and say, no, this is something that everybody should do. Or I mean, look, it's a, it's you know, for a long time, I wasn't interested and I wouldn't have probably taken kindly to someone saying, no, you really need to go and do this. <laughs> right. So you know, um, I think it finds you or it doesn't find you. It found me after September 11th, you know, uh, for a whole host of reasons, which I think are pretty self-explanatory, but I think, right, right. Um, you know, it's been a pleasurable experience and journey for me to get to know my parents. Uh, I think to get to know them better as people. I think all, a lot of us, when we become adults, you know, start to suddenly relate to our parents as adults and start to appreciate that they're people. Right. <laughs> And I think this is just one more way to do that is be, to be able to speak their language, hear their stories, visit, you know, their homeland and kind of see where they grew up and, you know, what their experiences were like and try to understand that better. That's been one of the, the real pleasures of, of working on this book, actually. In, in many ways, I have felt that this wasn't my history as much as it was theirs, or at least their generations. Right, uh, right. There's a real responsibility that comes with that, but also a, a real pleasure, you know, of kind of going to these places, learning, you know, asking questions, you know, um, and uh, trying to reconstruct a narrative about a certain time that you know that your, that your parents lived in or that your grandparents mm -hmm. lived in, in many cases, or great-grandparents who I never knew lived in. Um, and that, there's a real weight of responsibility. To, you know, how do you tell that story when you have no real way of talking to your grandparents or your great-grandparents anymore, you know, because they're not around anymore, you know? Um, right. um, but, but trying your best to kind of reconstruct partly down stories, but partly also just sources and the history and, uh, and weaving that together in a way that's meaningful. Right. Actually, one thing uh, I was going to ask you, I, I didn't see this show up in the book, but did you see any references to the 1920 pandemic when you were writing? Because a lot of things happened around that time. And you did mention there was a line about disease coming up, but was there, I know it uh, affected Iran very uh, significantly at the time. Was that something you came across in your studies? Yes, uh, not in huge detail. It's not something I was focusing on, but I do remember coming across uh, references all the time to not just 1918 uh, pandemic, but quite a few uh, cholera pandemics that existed uh, ah. before, uh, before then. Um, for example, in fact, I even um, 
there's a, uh, I think I ended up having to take it out of the book or make only a very brief reference to it. But it, there was a, a couple of pand cholera pandemics in 1892 and 1904, in which case, in which Americans played a role. I mean, there was uh, the American missionaries at the time <gasps> rounded up uh, patients uh, and took them to clinics in wagons. I mean, saved thousands of lives. The Iranian newspapers at the time were grateful to the, you know, were very grateful. I thought you were going to say they took the cholera over there. Okay, that's no, good. No, no, no. They played a very constructive and positive role. They, they opened up the, the American Missionary Hospital, which originally had, uh, well, really, it was just for Christians. Um, but the uh, American legation embassy, as we would call it today, at the time, uh, the American embassy really put a lot of pressure on the missionaries to say, no, open your hospital to everybody. We really need this, right? This is a big, great goodwill gesture and so on. Uh, so that's how we handled things in 1904. Mm -hmm. um, and I think there's actually a real lesson in that, if I can be permitted to get a little bit political here, you know, because that's not how we handled things in 2020, when we maintain sanctions, increase sanctions on Iran, make it impossible for Iran to obtain uh, medications and vaccines and so on. Um, I think it's worth remembering how the United States of just a century ago handled these things. It's pretty different. Right. And just to conclude, so, uh, you know, there's a lot of people of our generation who are elsewhere now, not in Iran anymore. We're in the United States and we're here to stay um, and, and other places in the world. What is your hope for the future of the diaspora? What's your relationship with the diaspora right now? <laughs> okay, I'm just gonna say this. My hope for the diaspora is that we stop being so polarized and vicious towards one another to recognize that you can have constructive political disagreements without accusing each other of being agents of this or that or <laughs> whatever, you know. Look, I, I, it's tragic. Obviously, as a revolutionary, as a post-revolutionary society, Iran is highly divided. I would say Iran is probably less divided, though, than the diaspora is divided in many right. ways. Um, mm -hmm. Diaspora is viciously divided and, and very highly polarized and actually very extreme on all, on, I was going to say both ends, but in many ways, there's more than two poles, uh, right. you know. Um, I don't care whether you're a leftist, Marxist, Mujahideen uh, uh although I'm not a big fan of theirs, but uh, <laughs> right. you know, if you're a Pahlavist, um, if you're a monarchist, if you're a diehard supporter of the Islamic Republic, if you're a you know, reformist, if you are somewhere in between, we have to be able to have constructive, fact-based, an an analytical, respectful disagreements with one another. Uh, we just don't seem to be doing that. All I see is on, on Twitter, and maybe Twitter is not the best place for this, but all I see is a lot of people yelling at each other um, and not engaging respectfully and, and a lot of name calling. And that's unfortunate. Um, you know, I have my opinions. I know there are people who won't agree with a lot of what's in the book, and that's fine. That's fine. Um, but all I ask is that you read the book, and if you have disagreements, you perhaps cite specific other books, other sources, other points of, you know, other um, uh, reasons for your analysis. You know, I don't see a lot of that uh, a lot of the time. And that's unfortunate. You know, I just see a, right. lot of, a lot of abuse and a lot of intolerance. And, and it's just, um, let's not question each other's motivations. Mm -hmm. You know, if, uh, if somebody is, uh, you know, if somebody is a diehard Pahlavist monarchist uh, opponent of the Islamic Republic and wants regime change, I am not going to assume that that person is being funded by the State Department. I'm <laughs> going to assume that that's simply how they feel. And I would ask that if somebody is a diehard supporter of the Islamic Republic and they happen to live in the United States, that you do not assume that they are somehow an agent of the Islamic Republic. Mm -hmm. or, or as happens far more frequently, you know, to me or to other analysts uh, who are trying to walk some sort of middle ground and, and actually be neutral and thoughtful, I think, about uh, about all of the uh, facts that, that often we get accused. Uh, I, I, I would say probably more frequently by, you know, by monarchists who get accused of being, you know, agents. To, I mean, I, my Twitter feed is full of people saying, oh, you know, uh, you know, this guy's uh, whatever. And, you know, there's no reason for that. It's easy. Right. There's, there's, there's plenty, there's plenty in the book that you can pick apart without accusing me of anything. Like, go for it, <laughs> please. I invite you to disagree and to, and to disagree constructively. And I will do the same with you. That is right. my, a pledge, you know, and I'm, you know, but I just ask that we uh, respect each other's, uh, or one another's, um, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Not good, uh, good intentions uh, that are, that are, you know, that we're not, that we don't become cynical and, and 
mistrusting of one another because that's not the way that it's not the way you move forward regardless of what outcome we all want to see a better iran we all may have slightly different ideas about what that looks like you know but um right. you know we're not going to get there by um you know by, by throwing around names well, the book is a great starting point to kind of see all this in context and see how these extreme viewpoints have gotten us to where we are. And so hopefully everyone can take a look at that and, and think about their own, uh, the way they engage, like you're saying. You know something, it's, it's funny, it's the one thing we have that Iran has in common with the United States. <laughs> right. Uh, we have an extremely polarized political atmosphere where no one seems to be able to have constructive disagreements anymore. Right. So hey, there's one thing we've got in common, right? <laughs> Well, yeah, I, I do have hope that, um, that like you said, we could just have hours <laughs> of constructive dialogue and just put everything on the table. Just, uh, it just seems like a toxic relationship <laughs> that needs, needs some mentoring and, and, and needs to be worked through. So I really hope that people read your book and, and take, take to that advice and that the future will be brighter. Thank you. I appreciate it. I mean, we'll look, see. if I can just say one last thing, I mean, we didn't talk too much about the book and that's fine. I mean, the big, the big takeaway from the book is that for the overwhelming majority of the history these two countries have had with each other, it's been warm, it's been positive, it's been a history of mutual right. admiration and fascination and even mutual idealization. The last 40 years, you know, does not characterize the entire relationship. And I, I think that's something that's important for us to bear in mind. It doesn't have to be this way. Exactly, exactly. Well, thank you for writing it. It was really a, a pleasure to read it. It was a lot of fun, very informative, and I recommend it to everyone. So thank you so much. Thank you, Leila. Thanks for taking the time to read it and for talking to me. Yeah, thank you so much.